Going carnivore in Thailand. Welcome. Yesterday, well, lunch had some eggs and a little bit of steak, I think. And then for dinner, I didn't really want a steak. So early dinner, around 5 o'clock, we had some air-fried chicken middle wings. Uh, not a lot. Maybe 10 of those little things. 10 or 12. And then later for dinner time, I really didn't want a steak. So what we had was some of that smoked sausage and a little bit of Noe's fried pork belly. They're, they're sort of like cross between pork rinds and, and uh, pork jerky is what I call it. Pretty good. But that's what we had for dinner yesterday. Uh, yesterday I was telling you a little story I think about me and my mom teaching me before I went to kindergarten. Well, I had really good parents. Mom was a cool one. Dad was super strict. Mom started teaching me how to drive when I was 10 years old at the amusement park, which was located across the street from the house we had. And the amusement park had a big parking lot, gravel, of course, not paved. And uh, it was called Kissel Brothers Amusements. So mom took me over in her Studebaker. And it was a six shift on the column. And she taught me how to drive when I was like 10 years old. Dad didn't know anything about it. So... By the time I was 11 and 12 years old, she was letting me drive with her on the street. I mean, times were different. I didn't have any license, but she put me behind the wheel. I'd drive and she'd sit over on the passenger side. I did that for a couple of years, drove like I was on eggshells. And then when I turned 13, she would uh, occasionally, not often, let me take the car by myself. Always cautioning me, follow the traffic laws exactly. If you get stopped, your dad's going to kill both of us. That was the thing. So, thereabouts, when I was like 12 years old, 11 years old, we had actually moved to another location. They had a house there. And it had what we called the long driveway. And that long driveway would link up to a lot that was further back. I guess we got some motorcycles doing some work around here today. So I wanted for Christmas a, what they called a mini bike. And back during the day, there was a company that made mini bikes called Rupp. And they made some really cool mini bikes. So I was like 11, 12. And dad bought me this cool Rupp main bike. I mean, he went all out. It had fenders. They were chrome. It had shock absorbers in the front. They were chrome spring over shocks. Uh, he went and bought the windshield. Like the Harleys had that went on the handlebars with the like curved windshield. 
and and he he bought one of those to go with it and everything. So on Christmas morning, when I was about eleven, I found this as my gift, and uh, well, I couldn't wait to go ride it. <laughs> God, I wish we had smartphones back then where they would film everything. But my family wasn't the filming type, you know, like Christmases with the Super 8 camera and stuff. It just wasn't that way back in, uh, I guess this is like 1966. So, Dad and Mom go outside with me. We got this mini bike and they put me on the long driveway. And I get on this and I take off and I go all the way back to the end of the long driveway and I turn around and I'm coming back and about halfway down the long driveway is mom and dad. So I'm going like crazy. I'm going past them and I'm turning my head like this and I'm waving as I go past them because I'm just so cool. You know, I got this hand on the gas. I guess I'm waving with this hand. And I go, I run straight into a telephone pole at the end of the driveway. Crash! Bent the front wheel. Didn't really get hurt. Broke the windshield. <laughs> Generally fucked it up. <laughs> that was like 60 seconds into the adventure. And Mom was freaking out. You hurt, you hurt. And Dad was laughing his ass off for being so stupid. So anyway, that's a little story about how Dad shaped me as to wanting nice things. And then something funny happened. For about a year till I was 12, 12 and a half, he was cool with everything. He fixed the mini bike and I ran it, and when I needed gas, I'd take the gas out of the lawnmower can and everything like that. But needed maintenance, he'd pay for it, you know, because I was 12. And then he sat me down. He says, we've got change coming here. The deal is, I bought you that mini bike. You've got other things you like. When you were 10, 11, 12, you needed something. I paid for it. He said, but if you want nice things in life, you're going to have to learn how to work. You're going to have to go out and you're going to have to get a job. Because if you want to ride your mini bike, you see, you got to buy gas. And gas back then was probably 15 cents a gallon or something. Uh, maybe a little around that area, 17 cents a gallon. But that was back when you could get a job as a kid and you might make a dollar, 10 cents an hour to get a job. Maybe a dollar an hour, dollar 10 an hour. And it didn't pay that much. So, you know, 15 cents was, was a, a chunk of change. Uh, so anyway, he said, if you want anything fixed, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. So when the I ended up, I said, well, how am I going to get a job? He says, well, we can help you there. So we had this, my first job was with this carnival company. And they, they rented tents and tables and chairs, and they had carnival rides. And my cousin Bill, he worked for him before I did. Turns out my mom had gotten him a job there. And he did real well working for him. So mom went and said, hey, I've got another, another worker for you here. I want you to hire. So they hired me when I was 13. And they worked my fingers to the bone. It was the hardest job I've ever had in my life. The hardest. They worked me so damn hard. 
And the owner of that company became my very best friend. He's no longer with us. Died in a boating crash. I can tell you that story sometime. But uh, I ended up going to work for them. Worked my fingers to the bone. And what it did was it allowed me to start building the character I needed to know that, A, I wanted nice things. I had one of the nicest mini bikes around. And B, Dad showed me right away. It doesn't come free. You're a young adult now. Start making some money. You're going to want a car someday. You better make yourself some money to buy one. I'm not buying you one. So that was my story of how a pretty slick dad who spoilt me from a very young age. And I, I will admit I was spoiled. I got a lot of things uh, given to me. Because I was adopted, didn't know it at the time, and I was an only child. And, you know, the American dream was alive and well. My dad didn't have a college education. He just was an ordinary guy, went to World War II and fought. I think he was a corporal in the U.S. Army. Came back. Got himself a job, rose up through the ranks, became a manager of, of a service department for a scale company at the time. And, you know, he had one job. My mom stayed at home. She taught me. She raised me. And, you know, something they bought, it. they were able to buy a home. And he paid cash for that house. At the time, they called that a custom home. It was brick. It had two-car garage. It had three bedrooms and two bathrooms. It had a fireplace upstairs and a fireplace downstairs in the basement. And it, he was able to pay cash. And he bought new cars about every five or six years. And he paid cash. And he only had a simple manager's salary to raise a family, even just one kid, but still raise a family. And, and I'll say one thing he taught me that I really want to impart here. Every time he, my dad and my mom had a great relationship. I mean, they had a wonderful, loving relationship. And all the time I can remember, the only thing those two ever fought over was something I did where dad wanted to kill me and mom was trying to get him to be more moderate and they'd have an argument about it and they'd be arguing over me. But I never saw them argue. And one of the things that dad taught me through example, it wasn't something he came out and said, I want to teach you this. But when he bought a new car, he bought two new cars. He would wait long enough so that mom would get a new car too if she needed one. And he bought two cars and then he bought another two cars. And sometimes he would buy her car first. He might buy her car one month and then a couple months later buy his car. But he'd buy her car first. And he taught me from that is if you're going to have 
a good relationship, you need to share. And you need to put the selfishness somewhere out of the picture. And let me tell you, this is 1960s, early. 1965, 1969, I was watching all this. And, you know, women were burning their bras and trying to make a statement. And men, a lot of men were chauvinist pigs. That's what they would have called them at the time, I guess. Who treated their wives like they were something to uh, to abuse and use without love and without sharing. So it's something I think that our societies today could learn from. If you really want a good relationship. Be a little more sharing. And I know there's guys who come over here to Thailand and they meet a, a woman. And believe me, there's a lot of women over here that have a lot of redeeming qualities. And I think there's guys who come over here and they become, they go into a relationship with a woman and they always do the minimal. I mean, like always never, never give that woman independence because they're afraid to leave them. It's like, okay, if, if you were, if you came over here with a little money, you're going to give a little money to a woman. Yeah, a lot of guys probably only give them a just nitten away amount of money, a little bit. Because they want to keep them dependent, sort of like the United States government does. They get people on the social programs and they give them just enough money to stay dependent so that they'll vote for them and put them back into office again and they can give them more money. They don't want the people to become independent thinkers and independent doers and reach a level of financial and emotional independence. They want to be to have the people dependent. And you know, they've been working on that since Lyndon Baines Johnson was in office. How do we make the people more dependent on us? And that's trickled down into relationships as well. Women try to have the men depend on them for whatever. And men, they want the women to be dependent on them. Now, they both can't have their way because somebody is going to be oppressed in that relationship. So what happens? The family unit just disintegrates, goes away, just disintegrates because our government's taught everybody, get away from me, fly, it's taught everybody that you need to be dependent on somebody or you need to have them dependent on you. Anyway, that's my story for today. Hope you got something out of it. Anyway, I get a little something out of it just thinking it through and telling it. Thanks for watching. That's all, folks.